Our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, just looking for someone to devour. We need to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We have to put on the full armor of God. Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Put on the helmet of salvation with the breastplate of righteousness in place and your feet fitted with the gospel of peace. Take up the shield of faith against the enemy's arrows. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Remember, be constant in prayer and alert. And with the power of the spirit, you will win the battle. Iwo Jima is a small island, only eight square miles, 660 miles south of Tokyo. It would become the spot of the deadliest battle in the Pacific during World War II. More than a third of all Marines were killed there. 22,000 Japanese, 7,000 Americans, was 26,000 wounded. This small island was, was saturated with more than 100,000 soldiers, 22,000 from the Japanese and more than 80,000 Americans as we flooded that shore. And this strategic war took place underway all for runway space for B-52 bombers. It would end up taking five weeks, and as I said, the deadliest battle in the Pacific. Last week, we were reminded from God's word that the earth is like battling over Iwo Jima, that there is a cosmic battle raging on around us at all times. Satan and his demons in rebellion against God, not battling for runway space, but for you for your family, battling over the hearts and minds, whether you like it or not, eternal destinies on the line. And Satan's aim is to discourage, to distract, and to disqualify you from the mission that God has upon our lives. And this morning, we're going to begin to put on the pieces of God's armor. That God does not abandon us. He does not leave us to our own destinies, but rather he gives us his armor. So listen as we read Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to reread 10 through 13, and then we'll uh, look at our first piece of armor in verse 14. Finally, be strong in the, in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we confess to you how often our mind just gravitates towards the physical reality. And that, Father, without your spiritual eyes to see, how could we possibly see? And how could we possibly know? But you, through your Son, have opened our eyes to the truth of who you are, that you have come to save us. And this morning, we come to your word, Father, begging for you to open our eyes further, for you to allow us to discern truth, that you are truth, and that you have revealed truth. And how often we get so confused, Father, with the absolute chaos and noise of this world, we quietly now, 
humble ourselves, we come to your word and we beg for your Holy Spirit to teach us. Teach us, Father, what truth is. Convict our hearts when we get distracted. We long to hear from you. Father, we just pause to say we long to hear from you. And you have promised that if we will seek you, we will find you. And that your word will not return to you void. We pray all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, this morning, let, let's start out with a little game, if you're okay with that. I want you to look at this picture, and I just want you to determine in your own mind whether you think that is true or false, because Photoshop is so easy these days, all right, things can be altered. All right, so this one, is this true or false? It is false. That's correct, all right? So I gave you an easy one to start out. How about this one? Look at it for just a second. That is true. Okay, look at this next one. Is that true or false? That is true. How about this next one? True or false? That is false. All right, how about this one? That is false. We live in a day and time when discerning truth is incredibly difficult. Misinformation and conspiracy theories abound. They run wild. Truth is an afterthought as sensational headlines serve as clickbait for advertisers. Political pundits, they, they create a narrative around hand-picked facts and they discard the rest. As the old adage goes, tell me what you want the numbers to say and then I'll make them say that. The press is no longer impartial as everything enters the spin cycle. With so much noise vying for your attention and allegiance, it's easily to scornfully say with Pilate, what is truth? And oh, how we need God's belt of truth. Satan is the father of lies. And he was a liar from the very beginning. And as we will see throughout this sermon, he greatly desires, uh, desires to discourage you with exaggerated fear. Think about what I'm saying for a moment. That we are more worried and anxious than ever before. Did you know that child abduction is almost half of what it was 25 years ago? And yet we raise our children in constant fear as if, as if it's up tenfold. Satan longs to distract with chaos and misinformation. An entertainment-driven uh, news cycle builds higher and higher dividing walls between culture, pushing us further and further apart into political camps. And so the first piece of armor that God gives is not an actual weapon. Rather, it's one of personal preparation. That before we worry about the protective pieces of armor, first is a belt. Now, in the ancient world, they had this saying called, gird up your loins. You probably uh, don't ever use that very often. But in the ancient world, uh, men wore uh, long, flowy dress, if you will, okay? And so if in the moment it was battle time, you can't uh, just run in a dress. I'm sure some of you ladies can attest to that. So it, it, here's the adage. This is what it means to gird up your loins. You, you take up that loose clothing and, and you end up tying it around yourself, okay? As we walk through the armor of God, you'll realize that Paul is primarily uh, pointing towards Roman armor. And here you would fasten the belt like an undergirdle or underclothes. You guys think of under armor, okay? But the whole point is that the function of the belt as it would be under the armor is to tie up loose clothing in order to prepare you for the battle so that you can run, so that you can move quickly. Now, I've been known to be an antagonist in my day, 
And when I left my engineering office, I had been running my mouth long enough. I had been telling my boss, who was just a few years older than me, that I was so much faster than him that I could, in a 100-yard dash, turn around halfway in the race and finish the race backwards. Well, on my last day in the office, he decided that he would take me up on that offer, and the entire engineering office went outside and watched the two of us run a 100-yard dash. Now, he was in his dress slacks that day, and he he had just semi-casual shoes on. And I was like, you're going to run in that? And he said, yeah, I'll do it. So off we went. The race was far too close for me to turn around halfway during the race and finish it backwards. So, uh, but but I, I barely beat him. We get to the end of the finish line. We're kind of laughing and joking, going back and forth. And suddenly I look down, and his pants have split down the seam, and, and the owner of the company is standing there with his boxers completely exposed. You know, loose clothing is not particularly for the battle. Rather, loose clothing is when you're distracted by it. It's why in in football, they put jerseys on that are so tight, it's like they're painted on. Because tight clothing means you move as one unit. There is nothing to get distracted by. You are ready for the fight. You see, the belt is not to defend against your opponent, it's to get you ready. And without it, you cannot use the other pieces of the armor as they are designed. So what is that belt that God offers us? His belt of truth. That truth is defined by God. The way that he views the world. That he says what is right and wrong. Simply put, God has revealed himself to us in his word. And the fullness of that revelation is found in his son, Jesus Christ. This word is your belt of truth. You say, now, wait a second, pastor. Later on, I know the armor. It's, it's going to say that the sword of the Spirit, his word, is a sword. And what you need to understand is, yes, that is true. That, uh, there's a later point when, when it talks about us battling the enemy, and the word will be the sword that you use, Scripture, so that you fight the enemy. But here, the word is used for you in your own mind, in your own processing and understanding what is truth for yourself. How do you feed yourself? How do you protect your family? By thinking God's truth. Now, I'm afraid I'm going to need to get a little philosophical over the next 10 minutes. But listen to me. This is very important. It is for your good to think rightly. To paraphrase G.K. Chesterton, uh, who said, all men have a philosophy. It's either well thought out or just poorly mixed together bits, broken and incomplete. Christians should be able to think well and care deeply about the truth, because after all, God is truth. Now, I would propose to you this morning that there are basically three sources of truth that you have to decide what is your ultimate truth. Philosophy of culture, yourself, or God's holy word. Now, you could add a fourth one in there, academia, but I've rolled that under the title philosophy of culture. Because even as a Christian who tries to build his life upon God's word, we are greatly influenced by the other two, philosophy of culture and the desires of your own heart. I say that because as we go through these first two, the idea is, not, uh, the idea is for you to listen with praying ears. That as we walk through these, that you would pray, God, show me where I am blind, 
because I don't want to be deceived. So the first source of truth, philosophy of our culture. Just like G.K. Chesterton uh, said that every person has a philosophy, the truth of the fact is whether you know it or not that it is true for each and every culture. And for that matter, subgroups within cultures that each of our tribes, and you can even say CNN and Fox News have their own worldly philosophy. All the way down to the family units that you were raised in, there is a certain philosophy of culture. The question that you must discern for yourself is what is my ultimate source of truth? God's word or the philosophy of culture? Now, let me give you an example so that you can know what I'm talking about. Over the past several years, our nation has been rocked by horrific videos of injustice against black Americans shown on the nightly news, deplorable videos that would make any Christian's stomach churn. And as you know, that has sent our whole country into a heated discussion about are there lingering effects of injustice from the past based on racism? A topic, by the way, that Christians should be very, very concerned about. Because the Bible repeatedly talks about protecting the vulnerable against the power of abuse. It's why we stand so supremely against abortion, because we are called to protect the vulnerable against the power of of abuse. And the Bible repeatedly talks about care for the poor and how we are a new people in Christ Jesus. Now, amidst this gaping cultural wound flows critical race theory, painting with its massively broad brush, declaring the systems in place are racist, unjust, that white privilege has created and perpetuates these racist systems. And like all worldly philosophies, what begins with a point of truth quickly twists and goes beyond into unbiblical categories. Let me be clear. Critical race theory is antithetical to the gospel because it classifies all of one class sinners due to their race and all victims of the other class righteous. CRT offers no forgiveness, no hope of redemption, only revolution. CRT is dangerous class warfare. It is only another system which actually promotes the very racism that it claims to undo. And it is the decision of every Christian, do I view the world through the lens of CRT or the gospel? How do we engage culture with common truths, understanding where common truths are, and then point them back to the hope of the gospel, not allowing them to remain in worldly philosophy. Hear me, Satan will challenge every generation with a whole new set of cultural truths that redefine and begin to twist the biblical reality. And hear me, this occurs in every camp. Your own conservative or progressive or liberal circle is not exempt. You will be faced with deciding, do I genuinely believe that the Bible is true all the way to the core? Is it my ultimate source of truth? And the challenge of the church is to be able to think well in biblical categories to understand biblical categories. You see, you understand injustice and the idea of justice is a biblical category. We are called to care about this. And yet to be able to see when culturally it goes outside of biblical categories and we have to raise our hand and go, no, 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 no. That is not the gospel. I've said a lot with that. And truthfully, I can't 
cover these topics in an adequate amount of time and space. We're, we're actually going to hold uh, what we're calling uh, engage on some of these topics. Uh, we actually have one coming up on October 17th. I'll tell you more about it in a minute. Your other source of truth that I mentioned is that you would find a truth within yourself. Check out these three headlines. These are just pictures, uh, but all three of them are headlines. The first one on the left, the headline reads, why has this man decided to become a goat? He has made himself a goat suit and will spend more than a week out living amongst goats And if you read the article, ultimately it says he's just trying to escape reality. The middle one, an Italian artist sells an invisible sculpture for $18,000. And then the one on the far right, my girl became the youngest trans toddler at just three years of age. Now what do all these three headlines and thousands more like it have in common? It's that the locus of truth in our culture has become the individual based on his or her own preferences. And look at our confusion. In his book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, Carl Truman asked the question, how is it that this statement, I am a woman trapped inside of a male body, has become so widely accepted within the Western culture, right? Not something off in the corner, but widely accepted. Something not biologically or scientifically true. Something that would cause your grandparents to roll over in the grave and go, what? What? Now, I don't mean to be insensitive or to at all suggest that gender dysphoria is not a real and an important issue. I'm not trying to be insensitive. Listen to me. The question is, how has this become something everyone understands? And the answer is simply because culturally, we have moved truth inside of each individual. We are told to look within at our own desires. Let them determine our identity. And anyone who questions our view of self is denying our truth and doing us harm. The problem is internally we have changing, contradictory feelings. My own feelings of anger or lust or greed, they need not be acted upon, much less become my source of truth. We need our creator. We need his word. We need him to show us, to define to our deceitful heart what truth genuinely is. We need his light. My aim this morning is not to pick on culture. It's to press us and to allow you to realize you are affected by this too. Either you will find your source of truth in God's word or you will find it in yourself. Look at how preferential and entertainment driven the church is. Here's a stat for you. Almost half of Christians under the age of 40 believe that it is wrong to evangelize. Wrong to evangelize. You see, they think that Jesus is good for them, that he is their truth, but should not be opposed upon others. Why? Because we've believed what culture has told us. The idea that truth lies within an individual, much to Satan's delight. Because the reality is, hell is real. And there's only been given one name under heaven, by which man must be saved. We need God's belt of truth. We need his truth. Listen to the context here of the belt of truth, because the context comes from Isaiah chapter 11. 
It's an incredible context. I want you to go back. I want you to read it. Because what unfolds there is Israel is a mess. They are a mess. And and, and they cannot get out of their own way. And they are even 700 years before the Messiah. They are desperate for the Messiah to come. They are desperate for him to to break through. And so the Messiah is promised in, in Isaiah 11, the first two verses. He is promised that he will come with the power and the wisdom and the understanding of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and you are refreshed. You are excited. And now listen to what it says in verse 3. It says, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. You see, where is his truth source? And he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. But with righteousness, he will judge. And righteousness will be the belt around his loins. And truth the belt about his waist. See, the scripture talks about when Jesus comes, he will see with spiritual eyes. He will hear with spiritual ears. He will be able to see and judge and discern the heart. Not what's on the outside, not the noise of culture, but he will be able to perceive with righteousness. He cuts through all of that noise. He cuts through the lies of Satan. And he is giving us his belt. He's giving us his belt. And he says, see what I see. Do not be deceived by culture. See what I see. Prepare yourself for the battle. Get prepared. So at the end of the day, listen to me, you must surrender to God's word. That you cannot pick and choose. You cannot have a smorgasbord of culture, yourself, and pick and choose out of God's word what you like and what you don't like. Listen to me, my pastor said this when I was in college and now I say it to you. There comes a point when you have to surrender to the word of God. Believe it fully. That it will be the basis for your life and the lens which through you will look at all things. I remember exactly where I was when I got to the point, because I had been wrestling as a college student, I still had lots and lots of questions, but I knew that God had revealed himself to me through this word, that this word is a declaration of who Jesus is, that Jesus had saved me, and I remember exactly where I was, where in my heart of hearts I knelt, and I said, you know what, I may have questions, but I surrender to your word. It will be the lens that I will view all of life because you have been faithful to me. So what does it look like for us to put on the belt of truth? Obviously, I could tell you some of the the things you should know, right? You have to make it a priority in your life. You have to study it. You have to memorize it. It's why we pray the word together. It's why we sing the word. It's why I preach God's word. But more than that, I wanted to give you some quick handles, takeaways about what it means for you to read God's word so that you do not approach it like a textbook. Okay, three quick things as you think about what it means to put on God's belt of truth and read God's word. The first Every time you read his word, you should read it to see the magnificence of God. That God's word is a meeting point. It is the revelation of a person. Not to fill your mind with facts, but to meet him. To realize that he is not like me. What do I know of you who spoke me into motion? Where have I even stood but the shore along your ocean? Are you fire? Are you fury? Are you sacred? Are you beautiful? What do I know? 
what do I know of holy? That God promises to meet you in his word so that he will reveal himself to you so that you could understand more of who he is. As John Piper says, he uses this illustration that God's word is a window through which you are supposed to view and gaze on the glory of God so that you could look out and see the sunset, the magnificence of God through that window. Because who else has the ability to say, I am that I am? That everything is from me and through me and to me. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Who was and is and is to come. Who else can speak all of creation into being and sustain it all just by his own thought process? Who else would send his own son to enter into our depravity, to be scorned by us, to be shamed by us? You know, I think grace should go like 10 feet, and I read in God's word, and it goes 10 miles, that you would meet God. If your view of God is not growing, there should be a danger sign going off in your mind because you have made him in your image. If he is not more holy, if he is not more sovereign, if he is not more loving today than yesterday, then there is a problem. Take him out of your pocket and see that he is not a lion to be tamed. Rather, he is the joy of heaven. And that heaven will be the the eternal unfolding where you will be able to, bit by bit, understand more and more and more the unfolding of the majesty and the grandeur of who he is. And you will never get tired. You will never grow weary. You will taste and you will say, I want more. Oh, if you could allow me to comprehend and to have just a little bit more of you. And although you can only see in part now, there is great pleasure in being able to see. Secondly, that you should read your Bible to hold on to promises that are given to you. Who does God say that you are? And what has he promised you? Scripture makes this constant appeal to your weary heart that God has met you in your depravity, that he is calling you out, and he has promises that are greater than you could ever imagine. And he is calling you to take hold of those. It's why we walk through every spiritual blessing, right? In Christ Jesus, you have every spiritual blessing. But the prayer of scripture is that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. The eyes of your heart would be enlightened to the hope that is yours in Christ Jesus, to the riches of his inheritance, to the power that is available to you. He is offering you his belt filled with promises. And the question is, will you take hold of it. Personally, I've shared with you guys that last November when my father passed away, that internally the hardest thing for me to process was that my father was the person above all others on this planet that I could go to just as I was. For me, that was my dad. He knew me. He understood me. I could have problems. It didn't matter. I could just come. And when he was gone, there was this gaping hole. 
Well, in God's providence, I was preparing to preach through every spiritual blessing, the promises of God. And those first two, that you've been chosen and adopted, all I can tell you is that in God's kindness, his spirit began to speak into that gaping hole with his promises. And there is nothing like when your heavenly father says, Jason, you can come before me that way. I chose you from the foundation of the world. I have adopted you as my son. You are in Christ. You can come just as you are, warts and all, confusion and all. You can come to me. The promises of God, there is nothing like them to absolutely change everything. Do you know God's promises towards you? Because his promises shine the light in the midst of absolute darkness. And number three, you should read for transformation. That God has clearly stated the aim of what he is doing in your life is to make you look more like Jesus. Now let's be honest, you're not quite done. All right? A little, a little gooey in the middle still. And so we are called to read his word with a humility, saying, Father, will you convict me of my sins? Will you show me where I am blind to your truth? So let me ask you, when was the last time that God in his word convicted you and cut you to the core His word is sharper than any two-edged sword, able to judge and discern between the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God loves you too much to leave you in your sinful cycle. In fact, the Bible says that if God does not discipline you, you are probably not his. So to put on God's belt of truth means to allow him to speak into your heart. To speak into your heart because he's growing, he's bigger, he's more holy, he's more just, he's more loving than you could ever imagine. Let me just tell you, I've been reading through 1 Peter in in my own private prayer time. And 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter paints this picture and he just says, behold There he is on the cross. He's been mocked. He's been spit upon. And he's not saying anything in return. Rather, he's praying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And Peter's press is, you've been called to be like this. I mean, that's convicting, right? Because then, then you immediately go, oh, oh, oh wait a second. What, what about me and my family life? What about me in my work environment? What about me with my neighbors? Am I like Jesus? So here's the deal. After 25 years of walking with him, I can just tell you, I need to read and reread over and over and over again and have his word constantly wash me so that I see more of his magnificence. So I take hold and remember more of his promises. And so I humbly ask him repeatedly, convict me for I fall short of walking with you. And it's why when we meet here weekly, It's why we sing of his magnificence. It's why we remember his promises. It's why we humbly ask him to convict us of our sin. It's why I preach the way I do week in, week out from God's word. It's why we ask you to go to a growth group and to dig in and to study his word. Because it's your source of truth. And we're so quickly and easily deceived. 
How many of you have ever seen the movie A Beautiful Mind by Russell Crowe? In that story, John Nash is a brilliant mathematician who's also schizophrenic. That means he saw people that weren't real. And he could talk to them and engage with them, but they quickly led him down a dark, dangerous path. Once diagnosed, John received medication that could control the voices, but this too caused him to be detached from reality, feeling drugged and lethargic. And so John made the courageous decision that he would come off the medication that he would actually lead a brilliant career as a mathematician. But he would have to choose to believe that the illusions were a lie, that they were not real. He would have to choose that he would not interact with them. And there's this classic scene at the end of the movie where his friends still ask him, hey, John, can you still see them? Can you hear, still hear them? And he says, yeah, they're there but I just choose to ignore him. Satan is battling for your mind. And just like John Nash, there are all sorts of illusions and distractions outside of God's truth. He wants you to be trapped in lies, distracted, ineffective as a Christian warrior. He wants your family to be repeatedly susceptible with new waves to every new generation. But Jesus has rendered the heavens. He has come down as the ultimate source himself, and he is offering you his belt. The question is, will you put it on? Will you put it on? Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, forgive us when we take your word for granted in a country where we have Bible apps and videos and more resources than in the history of the world in our language to allow us to know and to understand your word. Father, how quickly we take that for granted. How quickly we farm out the difficult questions for the experts. And we don't worry our mind with them. Father, forgive us for how quickly we forget that we are so easily deceived by the enemy. Father, allow us to see your son who is truth, who is your full disclosure, your radiant glory. Help us as a church, Father, to train and to equip, to think rightly, to meet people where they are, and to walk them to the hope of you. Father, I confess. how quickly I get distracted and lose heart. Would you stir that fire with strength and a longing to meet you in your word? We love you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.